All right, good evening, church. Hope you're doing well. Uh, I'm super excited and extremely honored and privileged to uh, kick off our series of gift givers. And um, and before I start, I kind of just wanted to share. um, So I I work in education, and the past 18 months, yeah, well, well, there's a lot of teachers in the house. Um, I've been getting my master's in credential the past 18 months. And last week, I just finished my program. Amen. Excited about that. Uh, Definitely God got me through it. And it kind of made me reflect on my first day in the profession. And I started off as a substitute teacher. And uh, my first ever assignment. So you got to remember, too, I have no management skills, you know, no techniques. I I felt like I was going to be okay because I've done Kids Kingdom before, right? Four and five-year-olds. Yeah. And I've done... And, uh, you know, and I knew kindergartners were cute, so I, I, you just want to squeeze them, right? Yeah. Um, but I wanted to squeeze them, but not for that reason, not because they were cute. But it was Luke LaBerge's class, yeah. right? And so I go in there, and um, I get to class, and Luke texts me before the bell rings and says, hey, so FYI, there's this girl that she's going to be crying for the first 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm like, okay. And so they come in, and sure enough, there's this girl crying, and there's like liquid coming out of everywhere in her head, right? Her eyes, her nose, her mouth, and I'm trying to settle her down. And it seems like it's 30 minutes. She probably cried for like 15. Um, But then I'm like trying to handle all the other kids, right? And they don't want to sit down. Like they all want to be my little helper. Like they're showing me where everything's at. Here's the bathroom. Here's the alphabet. Here's where we sit down. And like 15 minutes in, I'm already like overwhelmed, right? <laughs> and so she finally starts uh, crying. And so I'm just trying to get to PE because at PE, they go off and I can kind of take a break, yeah. right? And so we get to PE, it's all good. They come back and then this little girl gets on all fours and she starts meowing and says, I'm a cat. I go over to the little girl and I tell her, hey, you're not a cat. <laughs> and she meows at me, meow. And then another kid sees her, so he gets on all fours, starts acting like a dog, and starts barking. Next thing you know, the whole class is on all fours, acting like different animals. And I'm about to lose it. And so I'm like, I'm like yelling at them and trying to get them seated. And so, um, you know, part of the lesson plan was to show a video, right? And I needed to get this video on so they can be distracted and I I can kind of just chill, right? So I need to get this video. But I don't know how to turn on the video, and I'm like struggling, right? I know I need to get this video on. And so in my mind, I'm desperate, and I need to get help. And so I see the other teacher in the other room, and I know you're not supposed to do this, but it was my first day, and I I, I needed to leave the kids. But before I did that, I asked them, guys, are you going to behave if I leave and go ask the other teacher? (laughs) Smart, right? Hey, you got to make sure. You got to make sure, right? There goes my credential. But they say, they're like, yeah, we'll behave, right? (laughs) So I believe them. I leave the door, but the door closes, and it locks me out. It locked me out for like 45 seconds, but that was like an eternity. And so I, I, I peek in the little window, and I'm knocking like really hard, right? They're all out of their seats. They're wailing their hands like that. They're running around. Some of them are on top of their seats, jumping up and down. And finally, one kid like opens the door, and I'm like screaming at them and stuff and telling them to sit down. And so we didn't get to uh, see the video. We go to, <laughs> we go to the, class, the next door classroom, and we kind of just sit there for a while. Now, here's the climax. It gets better, OK? So um, there's one more hour of school. And it's like the home stretch. I took a nap at lunch because I was super exhausted. I took a nap right after I got off work. right? So, but the last hour, we're in these rotations. And I'm sitting at the table, and we're doing our rotations, and I'm playing this game with them, with this little group. And so there's been this little girl throughout the whole day. And I've checked up on her because she just had, like, low energy. Her face was a little red, right? She just didn't look good, okay? And so I kept asking her, sweetie, like, you need to go to the principal's office to see the nurse. And she's like, no, I'm okay. And I think she just wanted to, like, be with the other kids, right? So I asked her three different times throughout the whole day. And so we're sitting there, and she sits by me, and we're playing this game and having a good time. And I feel just a rush of warm liquid all over my arm. And she barfed all over my arm, right? So that was my day. That was my first day substitute teaching. (laughs) 
Thank you. If there was ever a day that I felt unprepared, that was it, right? Has anyone ever felt unprepared for something? Maybe it was your first day on the job like me. Maybe it was an important test. Or maybe going back to the gym like, you know, after a while that you haven't gone. Or how about it's almost going to be Christmas and one of the family members come to you and give you a gift, but you don't have a gift for them, right? So we've all felt unprepared for something before, right? And well, while Jesus was on earth, he made it known that he was going to leave, but he promised that he was going to return. In Matthew 24, if you open up your Bibles there, he says this in verse 30. He's talking to his disciples about the end of time. And he says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You know, the, the most significant point that I can ever preach, and I, I need you guys to hear this. If there's ever a day that you do not want to be unprepared for, is Jesus' return. Yeah, that's right. And I want you to ask yourself today, am I ready? Am I prepared to see Jesus come back? You know, the reason why this question is so important to ask ourselves is because it's a big part of why we choose to live as Christians on a daily basis, right? We want to be ready. And so in Matthew 24, the disciples are asking Jesus, when are you coming back? When will we know that you are going to come? And Jesus answers their question, but he tell, and he starts by telling them, well, the time and the hour, it's unknown. Only the Father knows. Right? But he does tell them to be prepared because it is unknown. And he tells them in the form of parables. Right? He tells them in the form of parables. And he t- he's telling them that this is going to happen. Like it's not a theory. It's not a perhaps or we'll see. Right? It's going to happen that every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. Yeah. Jesus is imploring them to be ready on this day. And he tells them in the form of parables. So we're going to take a look at Matthew 25. And this is going to be the text of our lesson today. And we're going to read this together, starting in verse 14. It says, Again, it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents of money, to another two talents, and to another one talent, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. So also, the one with the two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with the two talents also came. Master, he said, you've entrusted me with two talents. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have put, I have put you in charge of many things. I'm sorry. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received the one talent came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. I was afraid and went out and hid your talent in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. So you knew I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I return, I would have received it back with interest. Take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For everyone who has, who has will be given more, and he will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what he has, will be taken from him. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So Jesus is telling us how to be prepared for his return. And there's so many in this parable, so many things in this parable that we're going to touch on. But the main goal 
is to be fully prepared for Jesus' return. And I'm asking you to be honest with yourself this evening. Right? Because if you're not honest, I mean, you're, you're enslaved, right? You're in the dark. You're in bondage. And the Bible tells us that when we're truthful, the truth will set us free. And I believe that if we take this parable to heart, we'll be able to live in a way that's fully prepared to see Jesus. The title of the lesson today is Prepared with Gifts. Prepared with Gifts. So in this story, God is represented, or Jesus is represented as the master, and we're represented as the servants. And the goal of the servants is to be faithful to the master. And so if you look at verse 14 and 15, it tells us that all the servants were given talents to work with. And this is certainly true for us. Now, it's significant to look at what a talent means. So a talent in Jesus' time was a unit of measure. It was a unit of measure to measure weight. And it was commonly used to weigh out gold and silver. And so one talent is, was equal up to about 75 pounds. So even if you had one talent, that was a lot of money to work with. They were given plenty to be able to use. Now for us today, it can't mean just solely money. Because, I mean, if you're a teen or a campus disciple, you're not even in the one servant or one talent <laughs> servant category, right? I mean, I know when I was a teen or a campus, I was broke. So it has to mean more than money. I mean, it definitely includes money, but it also includes your talents, your abilities, your time, your energy, your resources. Anything that you can use to glorify God, that's considered a talent. We're all given, ta given talents to be able to use. Now in verse 14, it says that the master entrusted his property to his servants. I love that word, entrusted. My first point is entrusted servants. The master entrusted his servants to take care of what he valued. In other words, God entrusts you and me to take care of the things that are important to him. And so amazing because what this is communicating is that God has total confidence in you. Right? It doesn't matter if you have a higher education. It doesn't matter what type of job that you work, how much money you make. If you're a preteen, a teen, a campus student, a single, married with kids or without kids. You're entrusted by God with talent. You know, I love uh, the rocks. Um, it reminds me of just how they trust their kids with a lot of you in the room, right? They're with the Samaripas. They're spending weekends with Jessica May and Jasmine. And that's a lot of trust, right, if you're leaving your kids with a teen, right? I'm sure Jasmine is an awesome uh, babysitter. But I love how they trust you guys with their kids. We're entrusted by God to take care of what he values. It also says that the master gives an amount of money to each servant according to their ability. All right, so God entrusts what, uh, to us with what he values, but each according to our ability. He doesn't start just giving things to us randomly, but out of his infinite wisdom, intimately knowing you and I, he gives each according to our ability. Nothing more, nothing less. And part of what this means is that we shouldn't compare them, because if God really knows me, intimately, then he knows what I can handle, right? And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I look at Louis Moy, and that's a talented brother, right? He's got tons of wisdom. He can actually dance, right? He's got straight teeth, right? You have to have a nice set of fangs, right, to be in his line of work. I get the whole self-advertising thing, right? And then he has to have enough talent to entertain Mrs. Jen Moy, right? That's probably a lot of where a lot of his talent goes. And so God knows that I wouldn't be able to handle all of that, right? I don't have enough talent for all of that. That's God's wisdom at work, amen? Me and Lewis go to the same gym, and the same thing. He can't look at me and want to do my workout. He probably couldn't handle it, right? <laughs> Besides, there's only one soy sauce, so. Right, but that, that's God's wisdom at work. He knows what we can handle. But seriously speaking, it's out of God's wisdom to give everyone different talents and abilities. Like if you thought about it, how would the church function if everyone was the same? Yeah. Right? We couldn't reach that much people because of our lack of diversity and connect with them and bring them closer to God. Yeah. You're entrusted because you're unique. There's no one else like you. And guess what? There will never, ever be another person like you. Right? Here's an idea of how amazing God's Superior, creat superior creativity is. So I looked this up. 
According to the Population Reference Bureau, fancy word, they have estimated that there have been 107 billion different people that lived on Earth. 107 billion. Everyone different. Everyone with a unique fingerprint and earlobe. No one the same. And just to give you an idea of how big that number is, so one billion is a big number. If you ever try to count to a billion, it'd take you 33 years to count to one billion. That's how big that number is. So think about it, 107 billion different people that God has created, no one alike. Everyone special and unique. God gives each according to their ability. And so when you refuse to believe that you have, you have nothing to offer unlike anyone else, what are you saying about God? God knows you. You're an entrusted servant, and you're chosen to show, God, to show off God's brilliant creativity. In verse 16, I love how it says, these servants went at once to put his money to work and gain five more. And the same was said about the two talent servants. And so once you realize that you're an entrusted servant, you're expected to put his talent, the talents that he's given you to work. All right? The second point here is put in work. Amen. Verse 21 and 22, the first two servants, they were recognized in good, as good and faithful servants. They were commended by their master. And so it's clear that this parable tells us to put our talents to work. While Jesus is chilling in heaven, right, we need to be putting our talents to work. And Jake shared this in the beginning, kind of stole some of my thunder, but it's the Holy Spirit. Maybe he wants you to hear it again. If you turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4, go and go over there. We'll read it again. It's a good scripture. Your, keep your fingers on uh, Matthew 25. But 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 It reads, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. And you have to love this because whatever gift you have, whether it's speaking or serving, do it in a way where people get to see and experience God. Right? That God is using you so people can see him. And it's been so encouraging to see uh, people in the church using their talents. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but Blanca Carballo and Sarah Fall are on the, minute, on the worship team. They, never, they weren't always on the worship team, right? But they went to all the practices, right? They came early to church, even before they stepped on stage. And now they're on the worship team using their talents and gifts. And I was talking to Blanca about her worship journey this week, and we were texting back and forth. And so she did that for three months, going to all the practices, coming to church even before she stepped on stage. And I asked Blanca, what was your, like, what was your desire to get on the worship team? And I want to show you guys what she texted me. It's pretty cool. And you can just see her heart. Sorry, I skipped that one. It says, well, I saw the need in worship team. As I saw less people being in worship team, I felt the struggle. I wanted, I wanted to do my part. I felt that worship was important to help guests and fellow disciples to connect with God. My story was totally God. It's my mini miracle. I can freely worship God without letting my insecurities stop me from singing to God. Amen, Amen Blanca. Right? There's a disciple that knows she's, a, she's an entrusted servant. Yeah. There's a disciple that's putting her talents and gifts to work. You know, Blanca and Sarah put a lot of effort to putting their gifts and talents to work. And they overcame insecurities and different challenges with even wanting to use their talents in that way. But they stuck the course yeah. and they used their talents. And so if it's clear that Jesus wants to use our talents, then what stops us? What holds us back from using our talents and gifts to serve the church? What stops us? What holds us back? Well, let's go back to the parable. There's still one servant that we haven't covered yet. Let's see what we notice about this servant. 
In verse 24 and 25, he says that, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid. The servant greets the master with accusation. He says, I know you're a hard man. The servant is accusing the master of being unfair. He says that he's also afraid. And you look at this, and it says, it's basically his actions didn't revolve around trusting his master. It revolved around what he felt. It revolved around his emotions, his insecurity, his fear. And the result was not doing anything with what he was graciously given. I think this point, this, this point uh, hits close to home, right? Because I think a lot of us don't want to use our talents because we're afraid. We're insecure. We might not feel good enough to use our talents. I know the way that I can struggle is I- I'm aware of like, my abilities, but then I compare them to somebody that's better at it than I am, that we have the same talent. And where I go in my mind is like, man, he's a better speaker, so he should do it, not me. Or he has more experience at studying the Bible than I do, so he should do it, not me. Fill in the blank. They're a better singer than I am. They're a better speaker. They have less sin. They should do it. You know, we're burying our talents when we think this way. And ultimately, unprepared for our master's return. Or maybe we feel like if we use our talents, it's, gonna, it's just going to disrupt our routine. If I use my talents, then it's going to inconvenience me. If I use my talents and gifts, it'd make me feel uncomfortable, and I don't like that. If I use my talents, it'd cause me to make sacrifices that I don't want to make. Well, our master sees that as wicked and lazy. We're burying our talents and we're unprepared for our master's return when we live this way. And I get it. Sometimes maybe we're not aware of our talents and abilities and we need help. And that's a natural process of figuring out your talent. Sometimes we need help. And if that's you today, I want you to ask yourself, okay, what am I passionate about? Right? What puts a smile on my face? What do I enjoy doing? Or you can ask yourself, what really breaks my heart? Right? What, what need do you see and tell yourself, okay, this needs to change and then go do something about it? What moves you? What discourages you and like, man, that needs to change. I can't let that keep happening. Something needs to happen. You know, I know many times to take action, uh, we really need to be inspired first, right? You know, this week as I put in the lesson together, I was inspired by just even these verses and I came across this video and I love this video because they, they don't make excuses for their situation, right? Uh, they don't, um, you know, feel sorry for themselves. They have a deep passion for what they do, and they went after it despite what was going on and the life that they live. So let's watch this video. Me llamo Juan Manuel Chávez, más conocido como Baby, tengo 19 años y toco el chelo. Este chelo está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clavijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoqui. Y suena así. Una comunidad como Cateura no es un lugar para tener un violín. De hecho, el violín, un violín cuesta más que su casa. En ese grupo acá mismo encontramos el colado de violín. Y de ese que empezamos los instrumentos reciclados. La 
la familia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura y se vende. No pensaba antes que yo voy a hacer esa chumenda. Y me siento demasiado feliz cuando estoy viendo a un niño que está tocando un violín reciclado. Cuando ya escucho el sonido del violín siento como mariposa en el estómago, así una sensación que no sé cómo voy a explicar. Bueno, la orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos con la basura. La gente se da cuenta que no tenemos que tirar la basura muy fácilmente. Y no tenemos que desechar a las personas muy fácilmente. You gotta love that video, right? And I don't know if you've caught it, but the instructor said you shouldn't throw away trash carelessly, and we shouldn't throw people away either. And in Genesis chapter 1, God says that he made us out of nothing. He made us from the dirt. He made us from the ground, right? Trash. And you may feel like that, that you have nothing to offer, that you're not good enough. But just like the video we saw, in the hands of God, you can inspire the world. You can inspire the people around you if you live for God. Everyone has everything we need to bring glory to God. And we're given the responsibility to use what we've been given faithfully. In verse 21 and 23, if you look at Matthew 25, the master says to the first two servants, He says, well done, good and faithful servant. He says, well done. Not well thought of, not well talked about, not well dreamed of. He says, well done. It means we've done something with what, with what he's given us. I love what the one writer says, Norman Cousins. He says, the tragedy of life is not death. Rather, it is what we let die inside of us while we're still alive. God also sees it as a tragedy when we bury and hide what he's entrusted to you and me. Our master wants us to be prepared for his return. The parable of the talents tells us to use what God has given us to bring him glory. Prepared with gifts is truly knowing you're entrusted by God, you're special, you're chosen, you're unlike anyone else, and he wants to use you to bring him glory. Being prepared with gifts is being excited about our master's return because we want to show him what we've done with what he's given us. Right? That your whole life revolves around being prepared to see him. Let's be prepared with gifts when we see Jesus. Thank you.